All right, everyone, welcome back. <clears throat> we, can, we can call us to order. Uh, we're hoping for a conversation about Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, but also a little bit of a conversation about Poland and what just happened on October 15th. Um, so uh, let me briefly introduce uh, both of our speakers um, who have a relationship. So that's a rare privilege for us, right? You know, it's like kitchen table a little bit. Uh, um, Ann Applebaum writes regularly at The Atlantic, and she's a senior fellow uh, also at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins, where she co-leads a project on 21st century disinformation. Uh, her books include Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, Iron Curtain, Gulag, which won a 24, 2004 Pulitzer Prize uh, for general nonfiction. Um, her most recent book is a New York Times bestseller called Twilight of Democracy, an essay about uh, democracy and authoritarianism. She's been for 15 years a Washington Post columnist, a member of its editorial board, uh, no longer, freed up a little bit. Uh, she's been a deputy editor of The Spectator, a columnist at several British uh, newspapers, like all of our speakers. Uh, really recommend following in on Twitter and her husband Roddick on Twitter uh, because they're awesome uh, and, and sizzling and fun. Uh, but her writings appeared in the New York Review of Book Books, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs. Um, Roddick Sikorsky uh, currently serves as a member of the European Parliament. He's a distinguished scholar and statesman at CSIS, where Richard used to work, uh, senior fellow at Harvard University's Center for European Studies from 2007, 2014. He was Poland's Minister of Defense. Uh, counterpart, I think, to Christine's husband, uh, Bernard Minister, Kushner. Minister of Foreign Affairs. Minister of Foreign Affairs during that time. Uh, Radek has served uh, as Foreign Minister, as Speaker of Parliament. Uh, he was born and raised in Bigots, um in Poland. He graduated from Oxford, degrees in politics, philosophy, and economics before serving as a war reporter in Afghanistan and Af Angola. Uh, in 2012, Foreign mm -hmm. Policy named him one of its 100 global thinkers for telling the truth even when it's not diplomatic. Uh, so hopefully we'll hear some of that today. Basically, we've asked them to reflect a little bit on the war in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, why Putin invade, what's it mean for the coming months, both Europe and the West, both military and economically, uh, amidst the rising tide for strongman cults, nationalist movements, one-party states. Was October 15th election in, in Poland reassuring? Uh, we welcome your insights about these topics and the way you see also journalism playing a unique role in holding elected officials accountable, uh, authoritarians accountable, and making a uh, democratic life more, more possible. Thanks for coming, guys. The floor is yours. So basically, we're going to go 40, 45 minutes uh, of, of, of uh, fire hose, and then it's over to you. Okay. And not fire hose of falsehoods. That's right. Okay. okay. <laughs> So we're, we're gonna we're gonna we've we've done this only once or twice I think ever before appearing together, and the couple and, survived, and we've survived the marriage <laughs> right, survived, right, right. Um, and what we're gonna do what we what we're gonna do is ask one another questions. So he's gonna ask me a question, and then I have to answer it, and then I'm gonna ask him a question, and then we're gonna see how that goes. So, Ms. Applebaum, um, <laughs> uh, let's start deep. Namely, what is this Ukraine? Is it really different from Russia? Is it really worth fighting for? How is it different from Russia? And I'll preface this by saying that even in this room, and, and please don't be offended, I heard echoes of um, a, a colonial uh, narratives. You know, if I learned that Hamas believes that 23 million Russians died in the Second World War, um, that's actually a colonial narrative because it wasn't 23 million. Um, and they weren't Russian. Um, the figure comes from the Soviet encyclopedia, which probably correctly identified the demographic gap, uh, 1940 to 45, of the Soviet Union as it existed after the war. So in new and large frontiers. So the 20 million actually included Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Belarus, Ukraine above all. And so it included the population loss of peoples who were victims of Russia, who had Soviet citizenship foisted on them by force. And the figure also included the um, uh, churning out the, the, the body count in the Gulag, which continued during the war. Plus, the Wehrmacht hardly made it into Russia. It went deep into the Soviet Union, but the largest Russian city it occupied was Rostov-on-Don. Stalingrad wasn't conquered. The majority of fighting and killing happened in, 
Ukraine and Belarus, not Russia. So you see, because the Soviet Union was centered on Moscow and was our peer adversary, there was a, there was a, a natural tendency to look at the entire post-Soviet space through Russian eyes, through Moscow eyes. So is Ukraine really different and when, when does it start? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Ukraine, um, in this sense, is very similar to many other modern European countries in that for many centuries, it was part of different empires. And for many centuries, its borders changed, went moved around, went back and forth. The definition of uh, what was Ukraine and what wasn't was, was different at different times. And that makes it like Germany and France. It makes it like Poland. Uh, it makes it like Italy. It makes it like Austria. It makes it like um, um, most modern European countries. Um, the, you know, what is now modern Ukraine um, you know, emerged from a, a civilization called Kievan Rus. Um, Rowan Williams made a reference to that this morning. And Kievan Rus is the sort of ancestor nation of more or less of, of modern Russia, modern Ukraine, and modern Belarus, um, you know, with the proviso that modern Ukraine is the one nation that's been there the whole time, and the capital city of that was Kiev. And this is a sort of early medieval kingdom um, that a was... The province of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, founded by Scandinavians. Uh, so it, it was actually a Viking kingdom founded by Scandinavians um, who came down the rivers and, and set up a trading port to trade with Byzantium. Um, and so some of, so the early civilization is a mix of Scandinavian and Slavic culture. And the national colors of Ukraine and Sweden are the same today. For that reason, today. yellow and blue. That's how come they ended up with the same flag. Um, you know, and some of the names of the, you know, their overlaps in Helga and Olga, I think, are the same name. You know, so some of the Scandinavian names become Ukrainian names um, at about that time. Um, they adopt Christianity from Byzantium, and so they, this is the origin of Orthodox Christianity. Um, you know, and you know, and then we have a series of invasions. We have the Mongol invasion that Rowan Williams mentioned. Um, and and, the, and, and the, as I said, the territory moves, you know, there are different borders at different times, but for most of um, sort of post- Mongol invasion is 12, 1230 thereabouts. Right. And then the politics, with the same ethnicity, the politics start to differ. Right, and Ukraine ends up not, ends up on the, on, on the other side from Muscovy, and Ukraine ends up as part of um, uh, a, a country which at that time was called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And this is a big sort of early modern European empire that includes modern Poland, modern Lithuania, modern Belarus, and modern Ukraine. Um, and even at time, a bit of Moldova and even went farther than that at some points. It included some of what's now Russia. And Ukrainian identity emerges in this era. And the idea that there is a and you know, an identity of those people, which is somehow different from Poland, and of course it's different from Muscovy, which is farther away, emerges then. And there's a there's a Cossack culture, um, you know, uh, which which is a which is a very which is, they, they, the Cossacks are just are almost they're sort of nomadic people who settle down, um, you know, and, and have their own rites and rituals, and and eventually become you know become more. Um, you become sort of warriors, usually on behalf of other kings, and they emerge at about this time. Um, and the Ukrainian language, um, it, you know, separates from Polish. And to this day, Ukrainian is actually closer to Polish than it is to Russian. So the myth that it's a Russian dialect is another Russian colonial myth. Um, I, I won't tell you the whole history of modern Poland. Then what happens is that, um, uh, you know, Poland... Yeah, um, Poland is a very rough, it's not at all a modern empire. It's not centralized. Um, it's made up of, you know, there are different languages. And actually one of the things it's famous for is that it has a tradition of religious tolerance, more or less, okay? But by the standards of that time, it was religious, you know, there were, there were Catholics, there were Orthodox, there were Protestants, um, there were Jews, there were Armenian Christians, there were all kinds of people who were able to live there, partly because it wasn't centralized in the way empires later became, and partly because there was this tradition of people living alongside one another. And in fact, the reason why Jews went there in the first place, which they did at the end of the Middle Ages, um, was because of that, because it was more or less uh, tolerant. And that was why um, you know, the Ukrainians were able to develop a somewhat separate identity that, you know, within, a, within this larger nation. So it was closer to something like what Austro-Hungary became, 
rather than something like, say, Prussia. So it wasn't a centralized, homogenous empire. Um, and I should say, that tradition, the idea that Ukraine um, is somehow multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious persists to this day. And so when Ukrainians talk about themselves, they talk about themselves in those terms. So the you know Ukrainian is Ukrainians are Orthodox Christians and they're also Catholics. And there's a very important Catholic um, population, especially in the West, although not only, which is um, which is they're called Greek Catholics and they are they they sort of follow the Pope, but they have a slightly different church rite, which looks more Orthodox. Um, so you know and, and you know and of course there are Jews and there is also a tradition of, of Muslims who lived in Ukraine. Um, from ancient times, and these are, of course, Tartars who lived in Crimea, but else, also elsewhere in, in the country. So the sort of idealized, I mean, this is, of course, idealized, and there were plenty of pogroms and so on, but I mean, it was a, this, this was one of the ideas that they have about themselves as a nation, and this is different from Russia, is that we are this kind of cultural mix. You want to say something? And the other thing that I would identify as really, truly different from Russia is the political culture. Russia famously centralized everything, centralized in the head of state, whatever you call it. And Ukraine, in these 500 years, when they live by a different rhythm, a different kind of society, becomes a bottom-up kind of society. Well, that's also for others. So one of the things that also happens is that in the 18th century, Russia, together with Prussia and Austro-Hungary, partitioned Poland. Poland dis this, that Poland disappears from the map for 100 years. And what most of what is now Ukraine, with the exception of Western Ukraine, um, ends up in the, in the Russian Empire. And the Russian Empire then, uh, in the 19th century, carries out a kind of classic form of colonialism. You know, Russification, um, you know, there's, there's actually a, 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 a one, the, the destruction of Ukrainian language, um, deliberate banning of Ukrainian language theaters, Ukrainian language newspapers. This all happens in the middle of the 19th century. And so there's a, there's a kind of colonial attempt to homogenize Ukraine that happens at this time. Um, and uh, you know, some, of the, some of that grassroots nature of Ukrainian society also emerges. So Ukraine is also post-colonial in that Ukrainians are very good at organizing themselves at the grassroots because they were a colonized people, and that's what you did. You, you, you know, you 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 organized. Um, you you know, you didn't control any institutions, but you were capable of organizing a grassroots movement or a peasant rebellion, as you know. As later so happened. what you're saying is that what the Russians are trying to do now, they've tried before, famously the during the Great Famine. So the Russians have tried this a couple of times before. They tried a, ver a sort of mild version of it in the 19th century, just by banning things. Um, in 1918, at the time of the Russian Revolution, there was also a Ukrainian independence revolution uh, declared at the same time, also in 1917. Um, the, the Bolsheviks then came down from Moscow to sort of conquer Ukraine and sort of Bolshevize Ukraine. And that instigated the worst uh, peasant rebellion or the most powerful peasant rebellion that there has ever been in European history. So what we call the Russian Civil War, a lot of it was fought in Ukraine. And a lot of it was a kind of three or sometimes four-way war between the, you know, the white Russians, the Bolsheviks, the Ukrainians, and at times the Poles. So as the Russian Empire was breaking up, um, there was this enormous battle. And the uh, Ukrainian peasants came to within, what, 150k of, of so, 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 so No, it wasn't the Ukrainian peasants. So the Ukrainian peasants at one point took back Kiev. Uh, there's, there's one year in 1918, Kiev changes hands about 12 times. But there's a moment when um, there is a, there's a Ukrainian state, and because of the, weak, the chase the Bolsheviks out, and because of that moment of weakness, the white armies come within 150 miles of, of, of Moscow. And this is the one moment when the Bolsheviks think they might actually lose. Um, and so the, the Bolsheviks, and particularly Stalin, who at that time was Minister of Nationalities, became very paranoid about Ukraine. You know, if we let Ukraine go, if we don't control Ukraine, you know, Ukraine could topple us and we would be the victim of unrest in Ukraine. On top of that, Lenin had this obsession, not surprisingly, with Ukrainian grain. You know, that's the source of our food and so on. Um, the reaction to this is that in 1929, after Stalin begins this catastrophic policy of collectivization, um, so they, they have reconquered Ukraine, I should say, in 1920. Um, and for a long time, actually, in the 1920s, they allow a kind of Ukrainian state to develop. This is what P Putin referred to this at some point in one of his weird lectures. They allow a Ukrainian state to develop 
Um, partly because the experience of 1918 was that you, know, you can't crush the Ukrainians, let's play along with them. Um, uh, and then this changes in 1929 when there's an attempt to do collectivization and then there's an enormous, another big Ukrainian peasant revolt at that time. And the result of that is the Ukrainian famine. So the Ukraine, I won't talk about the famine at length, but it's a, there's a general Soviet famine and Stalin uses that moment of crisis to change the rules and to harshen the famine in Ukraine, you know, to, to go around and confiscate people's food, not just their grain, but everything, fruit, vegetables, you know, livestock. And um, nearly four million Ukrainians die in that. And, and, and simultaneously, the bearers of Ukrainian culture in the cities are exterminated. Right, and the, and the Ukrainian intellectuals and so on. Why am I talking about that? Because this is the background. And so why are Ukrainians fighting for independence now? Because they, you know, even though nobody else in the world knows their, this history, they do. Um, and the, the history of the famine and the history of being um, Sovietized or Bolshevized um, is, is part of everybody's memory. Um, and, you, you know, and it's the functional equivalent of, of the Holocaust. It's the functional equivalent of the Holocaust in there. It's a little bit different, but anyway, but they, but they remember they remember it that way. And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a moment where it's clear that Stalin believes that an independent Ukraine, you know, a Ukraine that has links to the West and isn't part of the Soviet Union would be, would be catastrophic for the Soviet Union itself. You know, it would bring down the power of Moscow. It might even destroy the Bolsheviks. And actually, he's not wrong. Because in 1991, um, when it becomes possible at the end of the 80s for the Ukrainians to create a new independence movement, which they do, um, they have, a, they have an election, uh, they vote to leave the Soviet Union, and actually that is the end of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union essentially breaks up because um, without Ukraine, you know, and, and it, it, it makes little sense. It doesn't have a, um, you, you know, they don't have a, and the, and the Russians let Ukraine go in 1991 with the idea that we're very weak now, we need to rebuild ourselves, but when the time comes, we're going to try and take Ukraine back. Um, and this is the, and there's a com their conversation, this is in Serki Plohi's book about, about that period. Um, you know, there's a, they never really let go of the idea that Ukraine is an independent country, uh, is, is a part of Russia or is a natural, is a natural ally of Russia. Um, and that remains an underlying theme, you know, all through the next couple of decades. Um, Putin's attitude to Ukraine uh, is built on top of that piece of history. And so Putin's understanding is that if you have um, a pro-Western Ukraine or a democratic Ukraine, um, this would be a problem for him. Um, so a, you know, and, and this is what we'll, I'll ask you to talk about 20, uh, 2014 in a minute, but the, the sight of Ukrainians protesting in, uh, in Kiev in 2014, carrying EU flags and chanting anti-corruption slogans, and then overthrowing the president um, and entering, walking into his palace full of gold taps and, you know, ostrich feathers. That's what Putin is afraid of. And he's afraid of that happening in Russia. And so crushing that kind of movement in Ukraine was a way of reasserting um, his own power. Um, Radek was in Ukraine in 2014. He was the um, Polish foreign minister who, together with the French and German counterparts, flew there to help negotiate at that time. Um, are there any lessons that we can learn from that moment? Um, is a uh, this is this is Mar this is February 2014. What uh, was happening? So we had a, a, a famously corrupt president of Ukraine in charge, uh, who, who was, by the way, a kind of autocratic populist. He was he was undermining the Ukrainian constitution and taking but over the courts. Promised, including to Eastern Ukraine, that he would be joining the association an association agreement with the EU. And then under Putin's pressure, he changed his mind at the last minute. And, and students uh, went um, uh, to the street in Kiev, they were chased out, and then there was occupation of the main square. And then some people were killed, and we went to uh, mediate, and a deal was struck that Yanukovych would stay as president till the end of the year, and then there will be a, a democratic election. Unfortunately, Yanukovych left the town, which looked like uh, um, an escape. Or maybe, and, maybe fortunately. Uh, and the deal collapsed. But the uh, consequence was that Putin had Putin took Crimea. So Putin, Putin sees that he's, Yanukovych was a Putin ally. And, and when, he, when Yanukovych escaped, um, he, 
you know, he, and, and he saw that this, you know, this language of democracy and this language about Europe and this language about rule of law is about to win in Ukraine, then he, you know, he says, right, I can't let that happen. And then we have the invasion of Crimea. And the important thing to take away from this is that it was never about NATO. Uh, Nobody's talking about NATO ever. Ukraine applied for a NATO membership action plan as early as 2008. I was there in Bucharest at the NATO summit. I was in favor of granting it to them, but the Germans vetoed it and we didn't grant it to them. And not a single millimeter uh, uh, of progress was that uh, for uh, Ukraine making it into NATO. It was always about the EU. It was about Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine remaining as a state and, uh, and becoming a more Western-oriented, democratically less corrupt state. Putin was perfectly happy to tolerate a corrupt, dysfunctional Ukraine. In fact, when he decided that he no longer wanted Russia to integrate economically with the West, he, he thought Russia was strong enough to create an alternative rival power of integration with Moscow at the center, with Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and others. And he was actually willing to pay for that. He, he gave uh, Yanukovych a $15 billion uh, loan, uh, of which I think $3 billion were actually handed over. And when that failed, he invaded. And then... Uh, we made um, some fundamental errors on the Western side. So when Russia imposed economic sanctions on Ukraine in 2013, we said that's between you and Russia, when actually it was all to do with Ukraine uh, um, um, uh, enforcing the association <coughs> agreement with the EU. And then when Putin uh, sent his little green man, remember, uh, these are not my people, um, we urge the Ukrainians not to fight, which was a big mistake. Because it this is in Crimea in 2014. Because it created the impression in Putin's mind that he can do it slice by slice uh, through these hybrid means. Uh, if, if the Ukrainians had fought in, in Crimea, maybe he wouldn't have done Donbass. And so, so it went. Um, so these are the origins. Uh, and so we are convinced that Putin uh, invaded um, not because he didn't want Ukraine in NATO, but because he wanted Ukraine, because they've always wanted Ukraine. Um, and, but my question to you, Ms. Abdulam, is are we winning or are we losing? <laughs> um, if you'd ask me this, uh, so let me take a step back. You know, in one sense, what Ukraine has done over the last year and a half is actually extraordinary and nobody predicted it, not even the most optimistic observers. So... Ukraine has now taken back half of the territory that Russia occupied at the beginning of the war, including you know, the, the north of Kiev, including Kharkiv and, and, and Kherson. Um, Ukraine has uh, now begun to push the Black Sea fleet out of its port in Sebastopol, which is in Crimea. There was a relationship before 2014 that Russia was allowed to keep Sebastopol as a kind of military zone, even though Crimea was part of, part of Ukraine. Um, but the, the fleet is now having to leave under pressure, even though Ukraine has no navy, but under pressure of, um, of Ukrainian missiles and drones. It, it can't, it, it's unable to stay in the port. They actually hit on Sunday, they hit another ship that was in dry dock in, uh, in, in Crimea. Um, a, at a conservative estimate, 100,000 Russian soldiers have died, um, with twice as many being wounded. You know, given that 15,000 Russians, or Soviet soldiers, I should say, sorry, died in Afghanistan, which at the time was, it, which was over a decade and was considered a huge military catastrophe, you know, this is a really remarkable number. Um, and, uh, you know, that Putin has been able to get away with it only because on the eve of the war, he shut down really every remaining civic institution in Russia, including there was an organization called Mothers of Soldiers, um, which he, he shut down that. He shut down Memorial, which is a, a kind of historical institute that also keeps track of, um, of modern conflict. So that there, there was really, there's no, no legal formal method by which you can even discuss the war in Russia in a rational way. And these, um, and these uh, casualty statistics are not widely known or, or available. Some people know them. But. Russia is now more oppressive, far more oppressive than the Soviet Union in its last decade. 
Yeah, no, Russia now is a, is a much more t totalitarian than it was in, say, 1986, certainly, or, or 84, or even. Three, three and a half thousand political prisoners. Under Brezhnev, there were dozens. Right. And under Gorbachev, there were eventually none. So, so it is a, it is, you know, they've reestablished a dictatorship really in order to carry out the war. And there's a, you know, if you want to know the reasons for the war, another part of the reasoning is that, um, you know, you, you know, it, the, the war enabled Putin to complete the reestablishment of dictatorship in Russia, which is what wars often do for um, for, for dictators. Um, the you know, the, so, you know, so that's, you know, in that context, you know, the Ukraine has been unbelievably successful. It's been successful because of Western weaponry and Western funding um, and Western training. Um, and so it has been able to, um, you know, to, to maintain uh, most of its territory. I should say Ukrainians are fighting, both they're fighting for their own independence, for their language and their culture. They're also fighting because the behavior of Russians on occupied territory and occupied Ukraine is remarkably similar to the behavior of the Soviet Union and the Red Army on occupied territory after 1945. Namely, there are um, mass arrest, concentration camps, um, organized kidnapping of children, um, you know, theft of most major businesses. So, you know, the the you know, you know, which by the way is also what happened in Crimea and in in eastern Donbas uh, after 2014. You know, and so at the beginning of this war in in, in February. Um, Ukrainians knew what would happen to them if they were occupied, and they fought against it because the, be, being occupied by the Russians is, um, you know, is to have a an alien dictatorship imposed upon you, and it can mean, you know, arrest and death. So it was a, you know, this isn't a battle just over land or where the border should go. This is a battle over, you know, how people are going to live under these different forms of control. So Ukraine remains. It's a rickety democracy, but it's a democracy. Um, it remains a place of, you know, different you know, tolerance of different kinds of views and politics. And Russia is now um, a very harsh dictatorship. But so that so so you you have had this record of success. What you do not have yet um, is you have not yet had the Russians say, "This is enough." You know, we don't want to fight anymore. And so the difficulty we are in right now is that you hear. You're now hearing enormous number of voices, even some well-meaning ones um, in the Western world, saying it's time to negotiate. You know, the war can't go on forever. You know, we don't have the tolerance or we don't have the patience. Um, I heard somebody, a friend of mine who's really very pro-Ukrainian, say to me, well, what about now a South Korean solution? You know, whereby, you know, okay, Russia occupies eastern Ukraine and there's a DMZ, you know, there's a demilitarized zone in between. And then we could integrate what remains of Ukraine, which is still three quarters of the country or even more. Uh, we could integrate the rest of Ukraine um, four fifths into, into you know, the EU and NATO. And we could live the way and it, Ukraine would be prosperous the way South Korea is, or West Germany you know, after the war. Um, and that's you know, the problem with that and the problem with the, even the less well-meaning people who say Ukraine should be forced to negotiate and we're bored of, uh, I mean, so whether you're, you know, you know, doing saying this in good faith or bad faith. The trouble is, in order to negotiate, you have to have someone to negotiate with. And as of today, uh, you know, maybe this will change. You know, but as of today, I see no evidence that Putin himself wants to end the war or wants to negotiate. So Putin's goal at the beginning of the war was the you know. So in 2014, they experienced this unpleasant change of power in in Ukraine. Um, there, you know, in, in 2022, the goal was to conquer all of Ukraine, to end the idea of Ukrainian independence forever, to reestablish Soviet-style dictatorship over Ukraine, um, and to wipe it from the map. And they had a plan and to use the resources of Ukraine for the rebuilding of empire. That's right. So the, so the reconstruction of empire was the explicit goal. They said so. They talked about it, and they continue to talk about it. Uh, so so this was their. Um, this, this, this was their program, and as far as we can see, they have not given up that program. And so I can imagine some kind. You know, they're pretty exhausted. We could have a, we could have a ceasefire. We could have a, you know, some period where people stop fighting. And what the Ukrainians fear is that would allow the Russians to rebuild their arsenal, retrain their troops, and then they could invade again next year. Um, and so the, the the dilemma now is, um, you know, is, you know, really not. It's not just about helping Ukraine win, it's now thinking more deeply about how to make sure that Russia loses. Um, and what is required for an end of the war 
is, not, is, is a political change in Russia by which I do not mean regime change. I mean, I mean you, know, you need something to happen in Russia you know, the, similar to what happened in France in 1962 when the French decided we are not fighting anymore in Algeria. Algeria is an independent country. We're done. It's not our country anymore. We're not going to stay in control of it. Or how the British felt about Ireland in 1916. You know, Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom anymore. We're not going to call ourselves the Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, not Northern not Ireland, and we're we're letting it go. And so you need that moment to happen. And all I can say is, when that happens, we will know. So there will be a, it will be clear from the language they use and the way they speak that they have given up on that big idea. And I don't see it yet. And so we are now at a very, I mean, literally this week is one of the, is one of the crucial weeks because we, you know, and this somewhat took me by surprise because there is a majority in the US Congress for helping Ukraine. You know, if you add up the Democrats plus the Republicans who want to do it, you get a majority. However, we now have a Speaker of the House um, who does not, for all kinds of reasons we can discuss, um, does not want to aid Ukraine or is, or is, or is pandering to people who don't want to um, and is, is making difficulties about putting a, how, a bill for vote on the House floor to continue funding for, for Ukraine. And so, and if the U.S. does not fund Ukraine, the U.S. is, I should say, Euro, U.S. and Europe is about 50-50. Who are um, U.S. is probably more military aid, EU more um, about seventy billion each. About more financial Very aid, um, and, you know, and so we we are. If the U.S. is not able to fund Ukraine, then there is a real danger that Ukraine could lose in the next six months or or, or a year, um, and that's you know that that's where we are now. I mean, I don't think it's an endless war. I mean, I think you know there 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 would be a moment when the Russians aren't able to fight anymore. There's a longer conversation that I'm, I'm trying to write something now about other ways to think about sanctions, make them more targeted, make them focus harder on military objection, uh, harder on the on Russia's you know ability to make and buy weapons and, and acquire Western electronic components and so on. Um, so it's not only about about arming Ukraine, but the but the threat the the same threat that we faced 18 months ago is still there. I would say. We would like to leave you with the thought that this is hopefully the last gasp of European uh, colonialism. In Western Europe, the assumption is that European colonialism was white people colonizing colored people. Actually, there was plenty of instances of white people colonizing other white people, as in Ireland <laughs> and in Ukraine. And the colonizers, when there is a war of national liberation, go through certain phases. They start by denying the separate identity of those they, they have colonized. What? Our peasants speaking a slightly different accent, separate identity? No, they're just our peasants. And, 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 the, and the British said this about the Irish in the 19th century. I've looked it up. You know, they say the Irish aren't really a nation. You know, they, they don't really have their own language anymore. They speak English. They're just peasants. Then, right. all right, maybe they are different, but in case they don't have a state culture. They're incapable of running a modern state, creating a modern state. Then, through violence, you know, we can deny them their aspirations. And then if the violence is sufficiently big, there comes a point when they decide, is it really worth it? And they have to come to the conclusion that A, the war of reconquest was a mistake, and B, any possible gains are outweighed by the current expenditure of blood and treasure. And usually it takes about a decade, I'm afraid. Think the French in Indochina and Algeria, think the British in North America, think the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique, and so on. Uh, well, if you count from 2014, that's not too bad. Sure, but it requires <laughs> a change in the elite of the metropolis, and they're not there yet. They're not there yet. Um, quick question, let's get in on that, but. Uh, just to put a pin in this a little bit, uh, you named that if you guys talk about Poland, there might be a little bit more of a religion dynamic because of the vote, went, went, went roll the church and so forth, complicated. Uh, and then in the story of Ukraine, it's more about the raw geopolitics, the history, the sort of deep Russian. And, and, and yet, 
you hint at this a little bit with Speaker Johnson. There's something religious a little bit in play around America first and probably the Trump polls and the like that make him disinclined to at least couple aid with Israel you know, support uh, to, to, to park Ukrainian aid and maybe for a while. We'll see how it goes. But also we had a speaker at this table last time and he basically said, uh, I'm a Ukrainian Orthodox cleric and I'm seeing in real time the use of the Russian Orthodox Church to sort of pull wool over the Putin vision for the people and we have lots of other tools that are in play with that. I mean, is there a little bit of a religion thread in this? So it's, yeah, yes. I mean, there was, so there's two, that you just mentioned two quite different things. I mean, I can talk a little bit about the, about the U.S. I mean, my, my guess about Congress and Mike Johnson and so on is that it's more to do with denying Biden any kind of victory. In other words, you know, if you imagine, you know, if there's a, if Ukraine collapsed in the next six months, you know, whatever, whoever is the Republican candidate wins the election. You know, so my, my, Biden tied himself. I mean, he's been a little ambivalent, but he finally tied himself quite closely to Zelensky. He went to Kiev, you know, he made, hosted Zelensky in Washington. He's made this, you know, foreign policy priority of his administration. Um, if they lose, you know, particularly after Afghanistan, um, you know, it's a, it's a real disaster for him. And so that would be my guess, is that that's the real reason. Um, there is a lot of unclear stuff about, you know, there are a lot of lies about religion in Ukraine. So, um, so again, the, 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 the Russian Orthodox Church historically had very close links to the Russian government, to the Russian czars. In the Soviet period, the Russian Orthodox Church became essentially a branch of the KGB. I mean, they were, it, was, it was completely penetrated. It was controlled. Um, you know, priests would report back to the center. Um, and it, when it, was a, it was essentially a branch of the state. In, in, in modern times, there has, there, and, in more, and more recently, there has been, you know, they're, they're now sort of, you know, it's, it's split in several different ways. But it has split in one important way, namely that in Ukraine, a branch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church now has separated itself very clearly from the Russian Orthodox Church and wants um, nothing more to do with it. And, and this, when this happened, this was before the war. And they got a decree from, from Constantinople from the, right. that, you know, on, on auto, um, on, on a separate existence. On a separate existence. But, the, but, the, but when that happened, that was before the war, um, Putin, Putin interpreted that as a, uh, you know, as a kind of outrageous Ukrainian, you know, anti-religion. You know, so the, the, the Russians continue to see the Russian Orthodox Church as a sort of branch of Russian colonial power. And this has very practical consequences. So in July, I was in a, a town called Kramatorsk, uh, which was the la is the last town before Bakhmut, which was famously uh, conquered by the Russians recently. And, and Kramatorsk itself was occupied by, by the Russians. And I was with the 26th uh, uh, Brigade of, of Ukrainian Artillery. And the deputy commander was the local priest. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, well, well the Russians came. The, uh, the Russian Orthodox priests were helping them to identify victims. So I said, and my parishioners, and I'm the Ukrainian autocephalous church, were killed by them, so I've decided I have to take a stand, and I'm now in the Ukrainian army. Right, so, so Zelensky, there have been arrests of Russian Orthodox priests who were seen to be collaborating with the Russians. Um, as a, as a, I mean, we, we sort of skipped over the counteroffensive, but I mean, we can uh, talk about that if people want. But, um, but, but you know, that, that's sort of where we are now. The Ukrainians have made huge gains. Um, they didn't make the late gains on land they had hoped to make over the summer. So that's and that's part of the current crisis as well. Um, you know, you know, and they're continuing to fight, and they've even had some successes in the last week. Um, you know, but the vision of how the war can end is still pretty far away, and it's not just because you know we're so mushy and we don't. You know, we're, we keep we want to fight as long as possible and so on. It's because there isn't a clear ending to the war yet. Um, there isn't even a clear way to have a ceasefire yet. I mean, there maybe there will be, but right now there it's not clear. And two factors are beginning to weigh against the Ukrainians. Number one, Russia has four times the population. And number two, Russia has moved its industry to wartime production. There are factories of equipment and ammunition worked at least 12 hours a day. 
and neither Ukraine nor we in the West have done that. And so Ukraine is running out of people and out, out of ammunition. So Russia will have um, will have forty percent of its budget next year will be military production. You know, so we're having this fight, and you know, in NATO about it should be two percent or you know whatever it is. The Russians are at forty percent. Um, and I mean, the, I mean, I would say the actual more important factor is not just that they have more people and so on. The more important factor is that um, they don't care how many people die. Um, and even over the summer, uh, you know, one analyst was saying to me, you know, there were some things they did that were crazy. You know, they they allowed thousands of people to die rather than give up two kilometers of land. And the reason for that was because one of their goals over the summer was to give up no territory so that the Ukrainian counteroffensive would look like a failure, um, so that Ukraine would lose support, so that they can you know, win next year. And uh, Putin thinks, not, possibly not incorrectly, that if he can sustain it to a Trump victory, he's won. Yeah, so he, 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 you know, he is waiting for the mood to turn, for the West to fall apart, and maybe for Trump to win so that he can, he can keep going. Uh, and this is possibly correct, because let's remember what the first uh, Trump uh, impeachment was about. It was about uh, him being recorded, blackmailing Zelensky, I will not give you anti-tank weapons. This is before the war. If you don't give me compromats on Hunter Biden. Joe Biden, in fact. But yes, um, you, know, it, um, you know, Trump famously dislikes Ukraine, has famously rec been recorded saying negative things about it. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to sort of make too much of Trump's deep knowledge of European history. Um, but, he, but he seems to have absorbed, at the very least, has absorbed the Russian view of Ukraine, which is that it's not a real country. Um, and, and, and that's the view, to be honest, in a fair, I'd, I'd studied um, Russian and Soviet history in, in, at university, and I studied Russian language. And I remember almost no conversations about Ukraine or indeed about the other non-Russian republics ever. I mean, it was kind of not really taught as part of a mainstream curriculum if you were studying the history of that part of the world. And I can also remember in 2014, um, there being a big problem with BBC and other correspondents who spoke Russian, worked out of Moscow, and knew nothing about Kiev, and also made a lot of mistakes. They would get to Kiev and they would you know, repeat Russian propaganda about Ukraine and about Kiev because they, you know, it just wasn't a piece of history that you learned or something that you studied. Can we flip? Yeah, sure. Christina Kran with uh, France Culture. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both for this very complete uh, picture. And I think the history was very, very important uh, because, as you both said, we know too little about the history of that part of Europe. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the issue is not so much for Ukraine to win militarily because we understand it's not possible, and even the yeah. chief commander gave that interview to the economist. Uh, he, he didn't say it's, well, sorry. No, he said it's a dead end. But he said it could be possible, but he said, he said yeah, we need more. Both sorry. sides are, are too technologically advanced, and it's going to be long, and so on and so forth. But so, as you pointed out, Anne, the issue is to have Russia lose militarily and politically. So my question is, the time frame, how can we manage that? Uh, giving more weapons? Now, we may, we may all regret uh, quite uh, cynically and also hypocritically that the US didn't deliver F-16 uh, jets from the very beginning. We all regret that <coughs> Musk, who did help at the beginning, but also obviously uh, prevented uh, the Ukrainians to use his uh, in one in, in one one instance. Uh, okay, so we may all regret that. What can be done militarily uh, as winter is coming to try and improve uh, the Ukrainian military performance? Then there's the financial support. Madame von der Leyen was in Kiev uh, the day before yesterday, uh, the head of the European Commission. Uh, to say, okay, we're all uh, preoccupied with Gaza, but 
we Europeans, we keep supporting you and there's enlargement and you're doing well with your internal reforms in order to obey by the European criteria to eventually join the EU. But, you know, does that mean that European support has to be increased? And how is that going to play with our own public opinions here on the continent? And last point, but it's unfortunately uh, the, the, the worst one, it's of course the timing of the American elections. And as you said, there's now that, sorry, it gets us back to Christian nationalism. Uh, there's now that uh, guy running uh, the, the Republican majority in the House of Representatives who, who, does, who, who said, okay, we're not going to vote uh, for a linked aid mm -hmm. Israel and Ukraine. So the timetable uh, seems to be really very negative. So what can be done uh, to cheat with time, and time plays into Putin's hands. Christine, I think the prospect is even more dramatic than you painted. We know what happens if Trump wins. We've already said it. Then half of the support the Ukraine is getting uh, would drop. If Putin conquers Ukraine, he will use the economic and human resources, like the Soviet Union did to go further, and then we'll have a war in Europe proper, with Ukrainians being drafted into the Russian army and fighting us. As the people of Donbass are drafted, and, and Crimea are drafted into the Russian army now. So the question for Europe is far more dramatic. Are we willing to step in to at least furnish Ukraine what the US is furnishing them now? Or are we willing to face the much more expensive and horrifying prospect but I mean, concretely, what can be done that hasn't been done well, on well, the European side? Sure. Europe has overperformed, has done much more than I thought. Ukraine has overperformed, the US has overperformed. Uh, Russia has underperformed, including the Russian army. 70, we've spent 70, uh, 70, 75 billion on the war so far. We are a 14 trillion euro economy. Um, most European countries are still spending only between 1.4 and 1.5% of their GDP on defense. The, the time of the peace div dividend is really and truly over. We need to ramp up equipment and ammunition production. We have the money. We are rich. We are not entitled to be uh, tired by this. The only people who are entitled to be tired by this war are the Ukrainians. Uh, they are destroying tanks and, uh, and equipment that is a threat to, to us all. So we need to find a, a European solution. And there is one. It's called the European Defense Budget, wonderfully named the European Peace Facility. <laughs> <laughs> Which consists in buying American weapons because not, we not only. do not produce enough. Well, this is our fault that I, we, I agree. I that, that we are not able to co collaborate enough to, to have... Uh, unified lines of uh, production. Um, but this, thanks to Brexit, I'd like it to be noted that there's a benefit of Brexit. Uh, the British were always uh, blocking the creation of this uh, defense budget. We now have it. We've spent it. We've spent seven billion. This has to be much more than seven billion. It's assessed in proportion to GDP, which is to say fairly. We, sh we should multiply it and from that budget, help Ukraine. Yeah. So that it's not just the flank countries that stand up to Putin. If, if we regard Putin as a threat to all of Europe, which he is, we should, we should all chip in. And this, this will you know, be part of making Europe a, a proper a, a, you know, a, a, a force in the world. And the French idea of, if we can't exercise some strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Putin, what else, you know, what, what else is it useful for? If this emergency doesn't wake us up from this slumber, what, whatever will? So, so, so this is the question. Are we, uh, uh, you know, if we just lie down before this threat, the cost will be much, much higher. Um, I would say uh, two other things. One is that 
if, if we really took this threat seriously, which I think some people in Europe do, but not everybody does, then we would be focused, you know, like a laser on um, Russian production facilities. So where are they making tanks? What are the ingredients and, and, and weapons and missiles? What are the ingredients that they're using? Um, can't we buy up the ingredients that they're using, or at least raise the price of you know, whatever it takes to make gunpowder or whatever the modern equivalent of gunpowder is? Um, remembering that Russia is now closely tied to Iran, from which it buys weapons, and one day may be able to sell them weapons. Um, you know, remembering that a lot of Russian weapons are, are when we find them after the missiles have, have, have landed in Ukraine, we discover Western components in them. Um, so focusing harder on, um, on the bottlenecks, you know, what it is, how do we stop them from weapons production? Um, how do, you know, how do we, how do we stop them from being to expanding their, their, and, and thinking a lot harder about this question of, as I said, it's a weird war in that nobody has to march on Moscow and take it over and there doesn't have to be a surrender, you know, anything like that. All we need is for the Russians to go home and give up. And by the way, once they've decided to do that, we can even have an argument about where the border should be. You know, you know, you can maybe you can imagine it being slightly different from what it was in 2014. I'm not going to go there because that's too con that's controversial. But, but, but that will not. Once the decision to leave has been made um, and to stop fighting, then all kinds of things will be will be possible on a different level of negotiation. But we have to convince them to leave. And so the means, and not all of the means by which we convince them to leave are military. You know, some of them will be, you know, in other spheres. Um, and we, and to be fair to the U.S. State Department and others, they, they do think about this. I mean, that was what the original wave of sanctions was about. Um, it turned out to be less effective than they had hoped. Um, but, you know, there are other issues. I mean, for example, a lot of European countries have confiscated the assets of various oligarchs. And everybody loves this. You know, there's a big yacht, you know, in the harbor, and we've confiscated the yacht, and everyone cheers, you know, because everyone hates the... What these in this neighborhood? Down 100 yards from here. That's a, um, you know, and, and so we... And they've confiscated the property. Okay, well, let's use it. I mean, let's let's sell the properties, and let's take the money, and let's give it to Ukraine and, or, or buy weapons with it. Or, you know, I think it's time to be, it's time to become more creative about how we're going to do this um, and more aggressive. And, and you know, th there, is, there is still, I fear, in a lot of European foreign ministries, um, you know, this idea that we're going to return to some kind of status quo ante and we're going to go back to the way things were so sooner or later, you know, and the Russians will become a normal trading partner again. And so, you know, let's preserve some relationships or let's not be too mean to their oligarchs in the meantime. And this is, I think, a mistake. I mean, we are not going back to the way it was. We cannot at, le at least not with this kind of regime in Russia. We cannot make peace with Putin because he has no credibility whatsoever. Well, also, he, no, more importantly, he doesn't want peace with us. He doesn't want peace. The war is in his, to his advantage. It has helped him crack down inside Russia. Uh, you know, he sees it as a part of his global war on democracy. It's part of, you know, what links him to Iran. It's part of what links him to China. It's part of what keeps him a presence on the world stage. It's part of his legacy. He likes this war, you know. He, and, but, and especially, he likes this fight with, this is referring back to our previous discussion, you know, this image of him as the defender of white Christian civilization against, you know, you know, the gay pride parades in Kiev, he likes that. That's, and that helps him legitimate his illegitimate rule at home. So he, the war is part of what he now needs to stay in power. You know, so he has no interest in ending it. And so we need to think about how to make him interested in ending it. Um, so this is not about putting pressure on the Ukrainians to negotiate it. We could do that. And actually, there are a lot of people in Kiev who would negotiate, in fact. Uh, we could do that, but then what? With whom do they negotiate? And what's the, who do you get an agreement with to stop the fighting? And by the way, you know, no one really ever talks about this, but even if we did, even if the Ukrainians won the land battle, and even if they took back all of their territory, what would stop the Russians from continuing to lob cruise missiles at Ukrainian cities? You know, why would, why would they ever stop? So they will only stop when, you know, it becomes too expensive or too politically difficult or too painful for them. And we need to think a lot more creatively about how we get to that moment. And it's not only about weapons.
Okay, I think we have seven sitting questions. So let's go uh, next to Paul Richter, if we can. We'll try and give shorter this. answers right. now. Right. Two questions. Hit that button. Which countries, which countries do you think in, uh, in Europe might step up and spend substantially more if the U.S. cut off uh, aid to Ukraine? And my other question is, has to do with corruption. Uh, the U.S. and some Western European countries really want the Ukrainian government to become less corrupt, corrupt. And I wonder how deeply rooted that government corruption is in Ukrainian history. Is, it, is that a, a goal that's possible? They have done what we asked them to do, which is to appoint a, an anti-corruption court. There, there has been some corruption even during this war. They, but, but not to do with our weapons. It's, no, but yeah. they did. But, you know, when they arrest the, <laughs> the president of the Supreme Court in the act of taking a million dollar bribe, is that evidence of corruption or is it evidence of fighting corruption? It's both. <laughs> um, uh, they know that it's the single issue that can delay their membership of the EU indefinitely and that, that, that we are very sensitive to. Um, as regards um, uh, stepping up of support, the finances should be union finances. You know, if you don't give them weapons, at least pay for someone else to give them weapons through the European budget. And as regards making the weapons and ammo, this should be a real integration process. So some people have explosives. Poland has the largest explosives factory in my hometown in NATO. Okay. Others have other stuff for the ammo. Um, we, we need a real... The, the, the support for Ukraine should not be delegated to the defense ministers because they only have stocks. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a task for entire governments, finance ministries, you know, to do with sanctions, with frozen assets, including central bank assets and so on, and production. Uh, it's a, it's a much, it should be a much bigger and much more integrated effort. Um, just one, one second about corruption. I mean, um, corruption actually is a product of one of the things I was talking about at the beginning, namely, Ukraine did not have its own state until 1991. Um, and Ukrainianness was expressed through civic institutions, grassroots organizations, churches, especially this Greek Catholic church. Um, and there's an enormous amount of distrust. This is actually changing now, but there was always a lot of distrust for people who are in power, people who are in state power. You know, they were always seen as, you know, um, and, and people who were in power, there was a weird, not clear relationship between the people and the nation and the, and the institutions of the state. The state was kind of distrusted. And actually, Zelensky's famous uh, television series, Servant of the People, is actually about that. So he plays a kind of ordinary school teacher who accidentally becomes president. Um, and a lot of what he does in the first few episodes in particular is mock the institutions of the state. You know, we ordinary Ukrainians, we were living our lives, and then over here there are these corrupt powers. Um, the war is changing that um, because, you know, this idea we are the state is becoming clear. Also, just in practice, um, there were there have been a few very wealthy people who controlled a lot of power and money in Ukraine. These are the you know, famous oligarchs. Quite a lot of them, what they had was um, industry, which has been destroyed. So one of the Ukrainian oligarchs, his base was in Mariupol, um, and that, that that doesn't even exist anymore. And so the nature of the Ukrainian economy coming out of the war is going to be a lot different, and it sort of already is. So I, I'm kind of, and mo the corruption is at the level of skimming off contracts, kind of. It's not. It's not you know, at least I'm not hearing right now anything grant, and I don't hear anything to do with Western weapons being sold or disappearing. How about uh, Carolina Vergara mm -hmm. of Cultura Liberana? Thank you so much. This was extremely interesting and concise. I have a question, one to each of you. First, a question to Anne. You have been talking about the, the difference between Ukraine and Russia, and I have been hearing um, a description of Ukraine, which could also be a description of any East Central European country, namely the recurring trauma of losing statehood, the same political culture, tolerance, 
religious tolerance, same competencies, uh, for example, of self-organization, and et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to ask you, to what extent Ukraine is very similar, even the same as other East Central European countries, and to, you, to what extent it is unique? This, I mean, is, I, this know, is the first question to you, and then there is also to Radek. Get that one, get, get that one, please. Okay, so, so as we have had just a tremendous success in the Polish elections on the 15th of October, um, congratulations to us. Uh, the question is, of course, about the future politics of the government in Warsaw, the new government in Warsaw. To what extent it will be the same and to what extent it will be different than what we have seen uh, after February, uh, February 2022. And at the same time, is it only, or, or what would, how would you describe the task for the new government in Warsaw <coughs> and in what extent it is also a task for other East Central European governments? Um, so I, I would just say, I'll just be very brief. I mean, yes, Ukraine, ha is its history is very similar to that of other Central European countries, especially those that were also part of other empires, which is actually everybody, you know. Um, it, it's also similar in some ways to, um, you know, parts of Western Europe that were part of other empires, which is also almost everybody, you know. Um, uh, so, so I do think it's similar. I mean, there are some things that are unique about it. I mean, the size, it's a, you know, Central European countries are mostly small. Ukraine is very big. Um, uh, it's, it's spent longer in the Soviet Union than, 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 than Poland or the Czechs did under, in, you know, in the Warsaw Pact countries. And that had a, you know, that had a deeper impact. I mean, I think the, the um, you, know, you know, that creates all kinds of other traumas. Um, but no, I think it's I think it's basically not that different. I think it's a the more you look at it, and the more you look at you know the, the history of shifting borders in, in Central Europe, the more it's the same. Um, some of you may not know that um, uh, when the war broke out, the Polish people were magnificent in helping the refugees. The government actually, after a moment's hesitation, was okay supported Ukraine and, and backed Ukraine in the, in the West. And, and, and there is this secret pipeline of American weapons um, uh, through a Polish provincial town. Uh, and uh, the town of Zeszów is, I like to think of it as uh, Poland's Peshaar. <laughs> the, the war uh, in Ukraine. So, 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 Zeshev, like middle of nowhere, and now it's like teeming with American soldiers. You're like, what? You know, how did this happen? You know? first, uh, <laughs> um, division. 82nd and, Airborne. Uh, <laughs> Before the war, it had two flights per day. Now it has 200. And it's this, land, this, this air bridge of American stuff. Um, but in the run-up to the general election, um, they, uh, the, 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 the outgoing party, competed in anti-Ukrainianism with an even further right party because there's, there is some fatigue with the refugees. Um, and so they've, uh, they've imposed, the, 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 the prime minister said, we're stopping shipments. We, we're Which wasn't imposing, true. Yeah. We were imposing a grain embargo and this and that. Um, we will, of course, stop that. But not only that, the best thing right now that Poland can do for Ukraine is to end its Cold War with Brussels and Berlin uh, and to um, resolve its own rule of law issues. Because these issues in Poland and in Hungary reawakened uh, deeply rooted stereotypes in Western Europe that uh, democracy is less secure in Eastern Europe. And this will play uh, against Ukraine becoming a member because, you know, we've admitted these people, they, they fulfilled their criteria. And as members with a veto power, they are breaking the rules. So we have to be doubly careful with Ukrainians. So we need to um, uh, fix that, and we will. Um, also, Poland can be an advocate for Ukraine and we in a way that's more convincing. For European defense and for these consortia of, uh, of, of uh, sustaining Ukraine. 
in various ways. All right, because we've got six standing questions. There's two ways to do this, but I'm going to suggest that we just plow through and then on the early end, okay, of 3.30. So it's adult learning. There's coffee in the back. There's restrooms there. Use them as you see fit. But we've got to get through this thing, and then we'll end, end quick. <laughs> and we'll if, have a breather. We can talk about we'll walk bit around a beautiful garden yeah. later this afternoon and have time and space to just chill later on, okay? So let's push if we can. Matt Kaminsky, uh, you're up. Politico. Thanks. It's a real treat to have you both. Uh, maybe this is a question for you both. Um, uh, so we talked about the um, problems that Ukraine's having in the West, obviously in the U.S. and in Europe, fatigue. Um, uh, and I just wonder, and to what degree um, can Ukraine itself do something about it? And does the Ukrainian government and Zelensky kind of realize that how could they sort of shift? I mean, what they're doing is they're losing the war of the narrative. They're, they're not actually, yeah. I think, the counteroffensive. You can make an argument. They've been quite successful in sort of pushing the Russians back, especially in, in Crimea, really projecting power. But And this war of the narrative, actually, sort of this, um, their problems on the, on the narrative front sort of predate the, um, the Gaza uh, issue by several months. You know, I think it was sort of villainous. It was quite unseemly. Uh, the way that sort of summit played out, you know, it annoyed the Americans hugely. It obviously annoyed people in Kiev as well. Um, and, you know, and it seems like there's a kind of drip and drip and drip of negative stories out of Ukraine. And, and Zelensky, who is such an asset as a spokesman and the face of Ukrainians' resistance, uh, uh, I don't think he's a liability, but he is not you know, the, the show's getting old. If um, I'm sure people around him sort of, since there are screenwriters around him, he's an actor, as, as you mentioned. Um, what does a new season look like uh, in, in sort of your view for uh, the Ukrainian story in the West and how can they sort of adjust their narrative uh, in this new phase of the war? And um, briefly for Roddick, uh, I want to pull a little bit more on that string of how a Polish government uh, how a new Polish government will sort of uh, do things differently with Europe. It's not cheeky, but if you were back in the foreign ministry, uh, where do you go first? How quickly can you normalize, if not even warm up, relations with uh, Germany? What do you see this sort of as being the kind of challenges to that? Schultz is not Merkel. Tusk doesn't have the same relationship with him that he had with Merkel. So how, how fast can we kind of see a different sort of European political dynamic on the European stage? I mean, I'll just say very briefly about the narrative. The Ukrainians know they have a problem, and I've talked to people in Kiev even recently uh, about that. Um, I don't think they have, you know, they also know they made a couple of mistakes, including in Poland, actually. But, um, but they, um, you know, they, they don't have a, a, a full answer yet. You know, they, I think they may uh, have a, decide to have a presidential election next year, which they were going to, Postpo I mean, there are all kinds of good reasons to postpone it, like it's going to be very difficult, maybe even impossible to organize fairly. Um, but they, they, you know, they're, they're looking for the next phase and they don't know what it is yet. I'll, I'll just leave it there. But they talk about it all the time. Uh, the Ukrainians, I believe, need to reach out to Trumpists. Um, uh, and they have two arguments at work. Um, number one, this is not just about Ukraine. If Russia manages to recover what it regards as a renegade province, China will notice and be encouraged to do Taiwan. And do you want that? And this was the original reason for why the United States got involved. Let's remember, Ukraine was not an official ally. Um, and the argument that wouldn't work with Trump, but would work with a lot of Trumpists in Congress is the following, um, for 10% of your US annual defense budget, we have destroyed half the Russian army. What's not to like? Help us destroy the other half. Um, yeah, and as I said, the direct link between Russia and Iran, which is becoming clearer. Um, this war is not just about, it's about Iran and it's about, above all about China. It's a demonstrate. We want you want a demonstration effect that taking back a renegade, what you regard as a renegade province, is much harder than you think. And uh, how to fix the relationship with Europe? Well, first of all, stop breaking European treaties, stop breaking judgments of the European Court of Justice, stop breaking your own constitution. It's the easy part, uh, and we need the recovery money. Um, it, 
Germany needs us for um, this new uh, treaty that is in the uh, coalition government and uh, whose outline has been presented. And Poland will have some, some things we will be supportive of and on some things we will have important reservations. Um, uh, we will stop playing a spoiler on principle, but we will also have some... Um, we expect Germany to change its policy too. You know, no more um, Nord Streams, no more uh, uh, taking advantage and, and making a lot of money for German industry at the expense of the strategic security interests of Central Europe. So there's a, there is a deal to be made, but there is also a mature conversation to have with Germany. Catherine Benhold. Yeah, thank you both. Um, so a couple of things. I was confused by what I perceived to you playing down the importance of NATO membership versus EU membership, because whenever I do reporting in the Baltic states, they're very clear that they thank their lucky stars for their NATO membership, uh, without which they are sure Russia would have already invaded or would be very tempted to do so. So in, in, in their view, in the view of many of the people I spoke to in those countries, the only long-term hope for security of Ukraine is to be a member of NATO. The EU thing is much more marginal. Um, to an extent- to, That was from a year, years ago, but anyway. Yeah, but to, to an extent, I feel like the recent history sort of proves this point because you pointed to 2008, the Bucharest summit, and the fact that both countries, Georgia and Ukraine, were sort of promised down the road a membership action plan, and promptly Putin invaded Georgia. And some logic, of course, is behind this idea that if you're at war with a country, that country can't become a member of NATO. So it's in every interest of Putin to stay at war with Ukraine if he wants to avoid Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. As long as there's war, that's not really an option. So I, I'm curious about, uh, about unpacking that. Um, also, and this is perhaps the elephant in the room, to what extent do you think that the war in Gaza fundamentally um, changes? Uh, the potential outcome of the war in Ukraine. To what extent is the diversion of public opinion, of, of funds, and also really the way that it divides Europe and the West, um, a serious problem um, for the outcome there? And perhaps finally, um, because everybody always shirks around this, and, it, it, and it's, it's diff difficult, I know, how do you define, how do you define personally, uh, victory and defeat? Because we talk about these things, but what does victory look like for Ukraine? And what does defeat look like? Well, I'll let you do the easy one, the Gaza part. Um, <laughs> victory and defeat, I think, is easy, actually. I mean, victory means that Ukraine um, is not at war, that Ukraine, um, you know, is not threatened with war, that um, Ukraine is, a, is an independent, um, sufficient state, you know, and it, which is allowed to join the EU and NATO, you know, in due course. Um, and who's and which is allowed to develop as a democracy as it wishes. Does um, that mean regime change in Russia? So I don't know. It means a change. It means that the it means that the Russians have to accept that Ukraine is a separate country and say we're not going to try to invade it or occupy it. Um, and once, as I said, once they do that, you know, then then we can talk about other things. I mean, Ukrainians, if the Ukrainians were here in the room right now, they would say we have to retake all of our territory because that's the only international border that we have. And they would also say we need some form of justice in the form of reparations, which, by the way, is a, you know, that's where we get into, the, again, back to the conversation about frozen assets, which I think sooner or later will be, may well be used as reparations, even, even while the war goes it's on. It's actually already decided. The G7 announced that the, 300 billion of frozen Russian central bank assets will not be unfrozen until Russia pays the equivalent amounts in reparation to Ukraine. So that's a done deal. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, go ahead. On NATO, it's more complicated than that because, because A, NATO security guarantees, as you know, are not as explicit and as, as uh, automatic as some people think. And B, and this is more complicated, there is nothing more dangerous for a state to have security guarantees that are not credible because it makes the recipient too courageous 
And it's actually also bad for the giver of the guarantees because it puts the decision on when they have to be triggered in the hands of the recipient. Uh, so you may get yourself into a very bad situation. And security guarantees by, the, by Western powers to Ukraine today would not be credible because, as you know better than I, Western publics would not permit their governments to go to war with Russia on behalf of Ukraine right now. So it cannot be done at the moment. Um, you're certainly right that um, the lack of NATO membership um, explains you know, just why the war happened. I mean, if, if Ukraine had been accepted to NATO in 2008, I doubt we would have seen any of this. Or Putin would have invaded anyway, and then the value of those guarantees would have been exposed. Or would have been tested. Would have been tested. Yeah. And no, and when, when Roddick said that EU was more important, what he meant was um, there was a moment in 2011, 2012, when we said, right, okay, NATO expansion not going to happen, but EU expansion will be okay. And so that was when the trade negotiations started. So, anyway. And we have Putin on tape saying, uh, uh, I have no problem with, uh, with Ukraine joining the EU in a, in, a, in, a, in a press conference with Barroso. So it's Russia, right? Remember, from, until 2011, Russia was negotiating an association agreement with the EU as well. These were parallel processes. It is Putin who changed his mind. You know, he's accusing us of staging a coup in Kiev, aggression, this and that. No, he changed his mind. I don't so, know if you guys saw it on the side of the about room. About Gaza, yeah. sorry, I didn't, uh, so you, you think that the Gaza war does not- Oh, sorry, Gaza. I don't, you know, to be honest, I don't know yet. Um, uh, it's certainly a distraction in terms of attention and time. Um, I, I'm told that in terms of, for example, military funding, you know, if we're going to give Israel help, it's quite different from what we give the Ukrainians anyway, and there isn't much conflict. So it's not, it's not something there's a little bit, but not, not very much. Um, it's more about time and attention. I mean, the, the, you know, if the Gaza war, you know, is over in two weeks, you know, then of course we're going to go on arguing about it for the next half century, um, if it go, you know, but it won't affect the war in Ukraine. If it expands and if there is an Israeli-Iranian war, which is, I guess, not impossible, you know, then yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a major distraction. Um, so I don't know yet. Is, you know, so you're in, in it, I don't, I, and also I don't even know whether less attention to Ukraine is all bad because now at least, you know, the people in America who want Joe Biden to fail have other things they can talk about to make Joe Biden fail, other than the fact that we need to make sure Ukraine loses. You know, that's a kind of... Gaza is very bad for Biden. Gaza is very, very bad for Biden. I mean, it's bad for everybody, and it's especially bad for the Gazans. You know, by extension, also by, you know, bad for Biden's um, efforts to build an international coalition yeah, they you don't, know, yes. in the Ukraine. Yeah, so their, their, their goal is to, you know, I, again, I, there is a lot of, there is this, pro, we talked about it already, this pro-Russian narrative on the American right and so on, but I, I genuinely think the real reason is they want to damage Biden and Biden's foreign policy, and by and to do so, damaging Ukraine is the fastest way to do it. It may be that Gaza will distract them and they'll think of some other other way that they can cause havoc in the world and that will help them win the next election. So, you know. Uh, Nick Casey. Sorry, that was, I mean, that was sarcastic, yeah. But. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed hearing your historical narrative on Ukraine's founding up until the present war. Um, because that preamble really helped me understand your worldview on what we're seeing now. And I was wondering if you could do the same for Israel and Palestine. Um, to tell no! Us. Yeah. We're going to skip the Rothschild tour, okay? We can, now, 90 minutes. Um, because I think that preamble also is like very, very, very key to sort of under, understanding like, you know, like what 10, we're seeing, books, seeing right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and everybody has a very different telling of it. And I, I, I really love to hear yours. Well, that would be, I think, another conversation. But let me just say that Poland, for example, recognizes the statehood of both countries. We recognize Palestine as a state. And we have a fully accredited Palestinian ambassador with the head of state. And in fact, uh, when we were previously in, in government, uh, we had a conference, uh, it was global or European conference of Palestinian ambassadors. 
I, I mean, I don't think this is the time and place to go into the history of Israel and Palestine, but I can happy to talk to you I mean, about you it. Did, you did a thousand years of Ukraine. Yeah, but that know, was the topic it. of the today's discussion. <laughs> right, you, don't, you don't have to talk about it. But um, No, yeah, no, we can talk about it after. I can happy to talk to you about it afterwards. I'm also not an expert on Israel and Palestine, and I don't know the history as well, but... Um, I'm delighted to discuss it with you later. But I mean, it just feels like that's we have 20 more minutes, and it's a, it's a, it's also a long and nuanced story, and it would take half an hour to tell. Yeah, I mean, yes, it is. A yeah, fair, a fair a fair punt, but to be continued. Yeah. Uh, Marion Khan from Times. Um, so, so at the beginning of the conflict last year, there was an attempt by the Europeans and their allies to sort of globalize what was happening in Ukraine, partially because of the nature of sanctions, is that you want your allies on board. And then it seems that, you know, the the attempts to sort of convince the global south that this is something they should care about and fall into line with their allies failed. Pro probably, uh, Depends. Obviously, uh, depending on which countries, I'm talking about the global south generally, but of course China took a view, the Indians uh, to some degree, the Turks, uh, a lot of countries around the world that we would have expected to have been naturally sympathetic to the Ukrainian point of view haven't done. And, and so the, the picture you painted of a post-Trump world is a very Europeanized conflict. So is there now a, a sort of diplomatic realization that the global south is not going to be an active ally? And if the best thing to do is to make sure that they don't harm us in this conflict, either through the production or the propagation of narratives that are favorable to Russia. Um, so is this is this truly actually becoming a very European conflict? And, and if you think about how diplomats in Europe are thinking, is this now something that they're going to think about much more on their own terms and to sort of that that whole effort perhaps to seduce the global south is now stopped because we've realized that there are limits to this so, so solution I, attempt. I, I would say firstly that the global south is a terrible term and we all, I'm sure you hate it as much as I do. And it's actually pretty nuanced. So for the two countries that you mentioned, India and Turkey, um, Turkey actually has supplied weapons to Ukraine and has been, there are some off the record negotiations. Some of them are two way, some three way between Russia and Ukraine and the US, and they mostly take place in Turkey. Um, Erdogan has been very keen to play some kind of role in ending the conflict. And he's he's a little, I, I'd say he's sort of ambivalent, but largely in Ukraine, he's understood to be pro-Ukrainian. Um, India is, is also complicated. I mean, India has a historical link with Russia. Most of India's weapons are Russian made, and so they have a contractual and economic relationship with Russia. Um, but, you know, um, Modi said very clearly at a public event um, that Russia should withdraw from Ukraine. And he also um, has been part of the chorus of nations who said this must not become a nuclear conflict. So, you know, it's you know, he hasn't been super friendly to the idea of full sanctions, you know, but he has also not been, um, you know, and I, you know, every time there's been a vote in the U.N., um, the vote has been clearly um, against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So there have been, I can't remember now, two or three votes, and they're always overwhelmingly that way. Um, you know, also Global South, you know, um, you also have to look at, you know, who's speaking and, and for who. So I have a Ukrainian friend who was recently in Nigeria, um, and she spent a lot of time with Nigerian journalists and intellectuals and so on, and she said, you know, overwhelmingly they understood you know, particularly those who understood a little bit of the history and understood this as a colonial or post-colonial conflict were very sympathetic to Ukraine. Um, those in Nigeria who do a lot of business with China or who were trying to keep on side with, you know, the Chinese business investments in their country were less willing to do so. Um, and so, you know, even inside countries, you get, you know, there are different views and, and, and arguments. And I think sort of the characterization of the global south says X or the global south says Y um, is very fair. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it is um, mostly a European conflict in that the real security threat is for, you know, it's first of all to Ukraine and then secondly to, to Europe itself. I mean, I think that um, the United States, uh, because, because Russia is also keen to globalize it, um, and because Russia seeks very much to look for allies, you know, whether it is in Zimbabwe or Venezuela, to bring them to the table, um, the U.S. administration fought, you know, has fought back. But I don't think it's the central, uh, I don't think it's the piece of diplomacy that will shape the way the war goes in the end. I don't know how to, if, how to, how to, how to make that sound better. But. I think U Ukraine has won the information war in the West and drew in the global south. It's more, it cuts in more, more, more ways than that. And the reason for that is, I think, is that many people in the global south 
think of it not in terms of what is our attitude to Russia or Ukraine, but what is our attitude to the United States. Yeah, but, but that's why maybe Gaza does complicate this, because sure. the, the accusations but of the hypocrisy that were already pre existing sure. are now oh, sure. more of prevalent. Course. Of course. And that, I think, includes Pope Francis, by the way. He's an, he's an Argentinian. <laughs> um, but I would draw your attention to one of the best reactions to the initial invasion, uh, uh, which actually came from the global side. The Kenyan ambassador to the UN made a brilliant speech saying, look, when the colonizers left, they left us with these ridiculous borders that crossed again, you know, across tribes and so on. And if we tried to create fairer borders, we would still be at one another's throats today. And we decided to let these borders exist. And so Russian claim that they are just helping their compatriots across the border and need to change an international border, we don't buy it. And, it, and this is outrageous. And that was very wise, I thought. And that's an argument that the Ukrainians could deploy more, more, more successfully than hitherto. What doesn't help is that China uh, in propaganda terms, is mouthing Russian propaganda. And as you know, China has taken over a lot of the media in Africa, for example. And that, that has an impact. Eventually, we might get Nastreen Malik to comment on this a little bit because she's from there. But let's go first, if we can, unless you got something quick, uh, to Christina Lamb, uh, Chief Foreign Correspondent for the Sunday Times. Famously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I've just come back from Ukraine last week. I've been going back and forth since the invasion started, the full-scale invasion. Um, I found the mood really different this time. Thank you very much, first of all, for your presentation, which is always fascinating but depressing. Um, and I was pretty depressed after this visit. It, the mood felt so different to the previous visits. The last time I was there was when the counteroffensive had just started in June and July. This time, obviously, the counteroffensive has not gone as people hoped. Uh, you talked about Ukraine being so successful last year, but the fact is Russia still controls, what, 18 to 20% of Ukrainian territory. Um, I found people very tired. I mean, even in places like Kyiv, which you, you get there and it looks like not a place at war. People are going to restaurants, people are going to the opera. Um, but, you know, you'll get five air aid sirens in a night. Even if you don't go to the shelters, it's tiring being woken up five times in the night to have that happening day after day after day. Then going to the front line, so I was in Kherson, I was in Kupiansk, um, and Kherson in particular, lots of shelling now. Um, you know, uh, talking to people fighting there, you talked about Russia having lost 100,000 people. Ukraine has lost a lot of people. They're keeping the numbers yep. secret, but we see every time we go there, going to the military cemeteries, the numbers of graves that there are. I was told, I went to some of the rehab centers, they told me 65,000 people have lost limbs, some of them three limbs. Um, so, you know, it it's really feels like it's taking its toll on people. Winter is about to come. People know that the Russians will attack the energy infrastructure like they did last year, but this time I think that if that happens, they will blame Zelensky's government for not dealing with it rather than blaming the Russians. Um, and then there is just a sense that, and of course I was there when October 7th happened, so there is the sense that the world is sort of losing interest, that we are losing interest in the media. And frankly, you know, it is a challenge now to keep you, at the beginning, you could write about anything on Ukraine and people would read it and we'd get it in the paper. Now, you know, it's, it's difficult coming up with things that will get people really interested. So how do you, you know, turn that round? Well, how do you make that narrative interesting to people? I suppose as journalists ourselves, how, how do you keep people interested in something that's going on so long? Um, I would say to that is that the real test of uh, our commitment to freedom is not when it was easy and everybody was enthusiastic. The real test is now when it's more difficult, more, a bigger challenge. The, and the question is, what do we do if Ukraine starts failing? Do we still keep this uh, red line on them not attacking Russia with our weapons? 
Do we still keep that line of not sending in our own soldiers? You know, are we prepared for Ukraine really to be conquered? And there would be serious strategic consequences to that. And political consequences. I mean, I, I, so I was also I was also in Ukraine last spring. I spent a long time there. I went to the front line and so on. And then I was also in September. And even in September, there was already, you know, that the difference that you've described is already there. And I also had this feeling that everybody's exhausted. Um, so you're 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 right. The you know the the the, the difficulty is. They're exhausted, and, and then what? As I said, you could find people in Kiev who would be happy to negotiate right now, and actually the sort of South Korea idea would be welcome. But the, the question is, is there anyone for them to negotiate with? And there just is no evidence that, you know, maybe I'm wrong and maybe something will happen, you know, the next tomorrow or next week to make me think different, fear differently, but, you know, you can negotiate. You can have a pause in fighting, um, but until the you know until the Russians don't you know, have given up at least their main war aim, which was you know con the conquest of all of Ukraine up to the Polish border, until they've given that up, the war is not going to be over, even if everybody else wants it to be over. You know, um, you know we we make a lot of there's a, there's another speaking of Congress. There's this line people sometimes say in Congress. You know, well, how come we're why are we fighting Russia? We should be fighting China. You know, let's let's make friends with Russia and then, you know, and get and get the Russians on our side and we can all fight China together. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's kind of you hear people say something like that. Okay. But you know, we don't decide what Russia wants. <laughs> I mean, Russia has its own set of interests and its own alliances and its own and, and Putin's particular interest is to remain in power, is to resist any kind of democracy movement inside Russia, which seems improbable now, but there have, they have sprung up before, um, is to expand um, his, his influence and create a, you know, reestablish an empire so that that's, he's now very old and older and he would like to be remembered for that. And those are his interests. And so we should deal realistically with what, who is Putin and what are his interests and not imagine there's a, you know, like Tony Blair would say, let's just all sit down in a room together and have a beer and, you know, we'll find some rational solution. I mean, the, you know, this is not a, this is not about what we would consider to be rational. So although, you know, I, I don't, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear some alternative, you know, if somebody presents it to me. But also, yeah. remember Ukraine has politics too. How do you survive as a Ukrainian president or government signing a deal with a war criminal, which you know will be broken. Yeah, that was the, the other reasons, you know. But, but as I said, even if they do that, I still don't see that how the war is over. So, you know, their, their, their choice is the same as it was 18 months ago. You know, do we defend ourselves or do we, um, we lose our sovereignty? And I don't and see I this mean, change. Most of the soldiers that I spoke to fighting said the West is giving us enough to fight, but not enough to win. Um, there's something really to that. I mean, there, there, there's, that's a, it's a longer, let's have a, let's, it's a longer conversation, but, you know, um, um, the West could have done a lot of things faster, you know, if they'd had the right weapons before the summer, then, um, then the counteroffensive would have had a better chance of succeeding or at least of taking back more territory. Um, why are we giving them planes now? Why didn't we do it last year? You know, why, why do we have these rules about what they're allowed to hit? You know, if we, if we, you know, if they were able to hit targets in Russia, maybe that, you know, all kinds of things that we've done. And there were often reasons for this. You know, it was about not escalation. It was about um, stuff not being available. It was because the U.S. Army took a long time to find, you know, the artillery that it had hidden in some warehouse we in Nevada. The level of our own stocks is. You know, so, you know, so some, some of it wasn't some, you know, the Ukrainians have a kind of conspiracy theory that they don't really want us to win. And that's not true, I don't think. Um, we, we just didn't move fast enough. We didn't anticipate enough. And as I said, we have been surprised by one thing, and we have been surprised by the level of casualties and destruction the Russians are willing to take. Do people you know, thought 100,000 people are died, half the army equipment destroyed. They won't want to keep fighting, but they do. Uh, may, I, may I just ask quickly, though, you, you mentioned the reasons we don't want to escalate. The thing that we hear a lot was the fear that if we did allow the Ukrainians to escalate and to go into Russian territory, 
that well, they, Putin would go nuclear. They, they do go into Russian territory. They but, just don't do it with our weapons. But again, the, the fear was that Putin would go nuclear. There is was, that fear that was no the longer there? That fear is pretty much no longer there because actually the Ukrainians did do that. I and, was told by someone who knows that the entire British ammunition production annual is enough for 20 hours of fighting in Ukraine. Although, I mean, they're ramping it up. But. I, I don't know if others had the same um, sort of visage on Radek, but when he was talking about peacetime countries in Europe at 1.5, 1.6% GDP giving to their military, I thought on the other side of the mirror there, I saw a visage of uh, Churchill, but then it was just Radek. Uh, so it was, it was him. But anyway, let's keep it going. Okay, so... Um, uh, we've That's got a, three more questions quick, just and then we're going to break, okay? Right, okay. Uh, Bart, uh, Bartos Walensky yeah. with Gazette. Yeah, quite, uh, quite quickly. Uh, on November 18, uh, 2021, uh, the chief of U.S. intelligence, uh, Mrs. Haynes, visited Warsaw and spoke with the Polish prime minister on, on well, <clears throat> imminent war that's, that would be started uh, by, by, by Russia. She, she presented uh, evidence, uh, intelligence evidence, and uh, well, Polish government was officially informed. Uh, three weeks after that, uh, Polish Prime Minister hosted, uh, well, Madame Le Pen, Mrs. Meloni, Mr. Orban, and other leaders of, well, uh, pro-Russian far right from, from entire Europe in Warsaw at a special summit. And uh, Mrs. Le Pen was treated as she was uh, French president. And this, uh, this gang of Putin friends uh, met again uh, on January 31, 2022. So, Three weeks before uh, start of, of, of fighting in the Ukraine, and uh, those people won't disappear from European political scene. They will still be there with better prospects of, of gaining uh, power in Austria. The populist uh, number one party, uh, the the victory uh, of, of Mrs. Le Pen in next presidential election in France. Uh, well. It's more probable uh, and more and more probable. In Italy, Mrs. Meloni is, is the leading power uh, now. And my question is, uh, how do you assess uh, the, those activity of those, of those uh, politicians uh, sponsored by Putin in Western Europe? How could they undermine our efforts to, to, to save Ukraine? And uh, what could they do to hamper uh, common European politics uh, in aiding the, the Ukrainians uh, fighting against Russia? You can have that. Well, Maloney has actually been all right on Ukraine. Uh, but on Le Pen, I mean, you know, she could just put a French stopper on, on, on the disbursement of EU money. We are, we are spending 1.5 billion euros per month directly supporting the Ukrainian budget. The reason why Ukrainian officials still show up to work, why Ukrainian pensioners still receive their pension checks, is because we send them the money and that could be stopped. We also have earmarked 500 million for ammo production, and we are negotiating right now a 50 billion fund for the recovery of Ukraine. You know, a, a founding member uh, uh, of the European Union like France could easily stop that. But you know, that might even be irrelevant because I'm not sure the European Union itself can survive a Le Pen presidency. <laughs> So, you know, we'll have even bigger problems. John Ward, do you have one too, Eliza, or no? I put it down. Okay, John Ward from uh, Yahoo News. Uh, question for Mary. you. Um, uh, Black, you said that gotcha. button, John, hit that button. You said it usually takes uh, a decade for this kind of conflict to ebb out, is kind of what you were saying. And you then said, well, if you count to 2014, that's you know, not so bad. And I asked you sort of as a sidebar, if you're counting from 2014, and I wondered if we could get your thoughts on the record on that. For Anne, I'd like to make a, you know, uh, American exceptionalist type question you know, and just divert to America for one second and just ask uh, something I've been asking a lot of people, which is if Trump gets reelected, what do you think happens in America? I'm counting from, um, from 2022, and there is uh, an additional um, uh, condition of ending a, a, a colonial war. Almost all of them 
in fact, all of all the ones I can think of, starting with uh, the American War of Independence, were ended by a different team than started them. Uh, because leaders find it very difficult to survive politically admitting that they started a useless war. Um, but that's also, you know, a, 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 a black swan, you know, if someone puts, you know, as the Americans say, terminates Putin with extreme prejudice, you know, that, that could change the paradigm. Um, you know, my, my, you know, there are a lot of many different things to say about Trump and they many out of the scope of this conversation. I mean, the only thing I would say is, yeah, I would worry that he would end the American commitment to NATO. And also, by the way, the American commitment to South Korea, the American commitment to Taiwan, um, more broadly, any, you know, he's not interested in allies and alliances. He said that repeatedly during his first term, he was blocked in various ways by the people who were working for him. I've talked to some of them even recently, and all of them think that he hasn't given up those ideas. And in his second term, he would have very different people around him, and he would behave in a, in a, a more radical way. So I would say, I would say that, um, you know, that's the thing. I'm, I also think people don't realize how easy these things are to end. So actually the NATO alliance, I mean, it's a treaty, and you know, there, was a, there was a ratification and so on. But it's very much dependent on um, the belief that America will react when someone is attacked. And all Trump really has to do is tweet something, saying, when, you know, if Poland is attacked, I will not help. That's all he has to do. And he's actually said almost that in those words a few days ago at, a, at one of his rallies. And when he was president, he said it about Montenegro. He said it, he said it, he said it but, you know, so he's, he's said it several times. So... All he has to do is say that, and then all Russia has to do is test it. Okay, you're not defending Poland anymore. We can hit Zeshuv Airport, you know, and then it'll be a lot more difficult to, to get weapons to Ukraine. Um, you know, or we can, you know, we, I mean, how long would it take Russia to overrun Estonia? You know, 48 hours? Of course, I'm saying that. It's a... uh, no, 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 the Battle of Narva <laughs> against the Red Army lasted six months. Right, okay, all right, take it back. Also, that was a stupid thing to say because that was what everybody said about Ukraine and then it turned the, out to be not true. But the Norwegian and Dutch Waffen SS helped. Right, okay, we don't have them this time. Um, so, you know, so, but, it, but, but he could immediately test it if he wanted to. Um, anyway. That, that's my greatest fear. All right. Well, this conversation has been uh, rich and sobering and timely. And thank you, Radhika and Anne, very much. Thank you.